our Father who is in heaven. We are so grateful because in our weakness, in our short-sightedness, you have given your word. The sure word of prophecy, which we will do well to heed as a light that shineth forth from the dark place until the morning star rises forth in our hearts. And we are sure, loving Father, that your word is truth. Your word stands forever. Grass withers, flowers fade, but your word endureth forever. So, Lord God Almighty, come and speak to us. So you say to Solomon through Paul, that he has known the holy scriptures which are able to make him wise and to salvation by faith through Jesus Christ. We want to pray that you make us wise through your word this evening also. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, let us start by looking at the making of the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel is an interesting book. But if you are to appreciate it, you must first of all excavate the background and the surrounding of the conditions that precipitate the book of Daniel. Before Daniel came, in the book of Second Kings or Chronicles, if you want to read either way, in the book of Second Kings, we have a situation. Hezekiah, the king, falls sick and is about to die and Isaiah comes and speaks to him that God has given him an addition of years. And then when Hezekiah wakes up, the king of the enemy comes to his portals and he takes him to the, the armory section, he takes him to where they keep all the gold and everything and shows off his um, material. And God is not pleased with it and God says to him, you will be punished for this. For you, you will live your 15 years and you will die. But down the ages, your sons and your very noble people will be carried off to the foreign land. But not because of that. Then Isaiah dies. His son comes on board and then there is another one called Manasseh. Wicked beyond measure. But then along the way he also comes Confesses. And then there's another one called Ammon. He also reigns and every king that comes is evil in the sight of God. And then all of a sudden, when one king dies, another young man, eight years of age, gets to the throne. Josiah. And everyone wonders, what will this eight-year-old boy do? But this young man gets a zeal for God and he begins to do a few things. So 12 years down the road, this young man tells one of the priests to go into the temple and look at how they can make it good. And as they are looking at how to clean it, he discovers a book of Deuteronomy or the book of Moses. And then they bring it before the king and read it in the presence of this young king. And the king said, what have we been doing all along? We have sinned. So he tears his clothes and raises his voice to God and says to everyone, it is time for reformation and revival in Israel. So the Bible says, then the king commanded, this young king, he commanded that all people, and he said to them, keep the Passover to the Lord your God, as it is written in this book of the covenant which was being read to him. He discovered that they had never kept the Passover feast since days past. And so he said, no, we must restitute every command that God gave and every feast that God gave. We must go back to our old selves. Ah, people say, oh, the king is talking. And so the Bible says, he says to them, such a Passover surely had never been held since the days of the judges. You remember the judges? You know how many kings had passed even David's days? So the, the scripture says even in David's time, the Passover they had was not compared to what this young man gave to get the Lord. Serious. Passover. Everyone was excited in Israel. They said a new king has come. And God, God in heaven was excited of course as every time he is when we come back to him. And so the Bible says that the, 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 not in all the days of the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah. The Bible says but in the 18th year of King Josiah this Passover was held before the Lord in Jerusalem. The Jerusalem was littered people in the presence of God. Everyone had removed all the bangles. Everyone had cut down every tie and every eye, every heart was heavenward. 
Now, it is always true that when people go through a reformation, you expect blessings, not so? In fact, the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28, says, when Israel is obedient, God will bless them. He will not bring diseases upon them. He will not bring a famine upon them. Blessings will run over them and bypass them. You know, have you ever been in a situation where a blessing is running after you? You people, you have never been there. There are times when you are blessed that you have not even asked God and God is still giving. Eh? The blessing overtakes you and you look at it going, then you say stop a bit and it stops for you. There are times when God is so spoiled for you. So this guy said, now is the day. There has never been a king so righteous like this young man, Josiah. God's blessings will overtake us now. So the Bible says, ah, the man did not stop there. He gave a command. He says, moreover, Josiah, put away those who consulted mediums and spiritists, the household gods. He told everyone, remove every god in your house. We want to be pure in the sight of God. And idols and all abominations, remove them. And people removed them. And the Bible says, and there was seen in the land of Judah and Jerusalem that he might perform the word of the law which were written in the book that Hilkiah the priest found in the house of the Lord. The young man listened to the word of God and he wanted to do it exactly as God had commanded. There had never been a reformation like this one. And then when they were even describing what this man did, look at the adjectives that are given to Josiah. The Bible says, now, before him, that is Je Josiah, there was no king like him. Have you heard that statement? There was no like who turned to the Lord with all his and with all his and with all his according to the law of you know in Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 5 it's where you find these words the Bible says and God said to these people of the Lord you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. When Jesus was asked what are the two or what is the greatest law he said to them the first is as such Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Matthew 22, verse 36 and 37. In other words, Josiah fulfilled the very words of Jesus Christ. He fulfilled the words of Deuteronomy. He was a king in the eyes of God, who when God looked upon, would smile and say, my child. Even people began to conclude According to this writer called Mordecai, a Jew, Mordecai Cohen, he says, King Josiah displayed a special royalty to God as no other king had done before and afterwards. And because of this, he was likened unto David, the king of Israel. And then something happened. You know, you people, you are not Jews, so you don't appreciate these things. Eh? The Jews are do. When a Jew was faithful, he expected God to be faithful to him. When David was faithful to God, he went to battles and God fought for. When Hezekiah was attacked and he prayed to God and he was faithful in God's sight, God killed his enemies for him. When Jehoshaphat was in trouble and surrounded, he went to God and God said to him, you shall not fight. Stand still and know that I am. So this faithful king, the king of Egypt, Neko was coming and was going to Kakmesh. He wanted to get at that point where there is an intersection before the river Euphrates that goes to Babylon. So he wanted to take control of it and when he controls it, he controls that part of the world also. So King Neko comes and as he's coming, King Josiah 
wants to stop him from coming and passing through his territory. And King Neko sends ambassadors to King Josiah and says to him, please don't interrupt me. Stay put. I'm not with you. I'm not contending with you. I just want to go forth and take claim of that place. Josiah says, no. We are also big people. We are with God. I'm coming. And then the Bible says he went. And while he was in the field, the archers of the Egyptians shot straight at the heart of Josiah. Just a minute. A reformer. A revivalist. One in the likelihood of David cannot even win a war. So the Bible says people began to lament and when he died the Bible says, Jeremiah himself, the prophet, who had had whole hopes in this young man, in this king, who demonstrated a zeal for God. Jeremiah lamented for Josiah. And to this very day of the writing of the book of Chronicles, people sang songs for Josiah in their lamentations. They made it a custom in Israel that they will mourn Josiah. And Jeremiah sang a lamentation. Lamentation chapter 4 verse 20. Listen to how Jeremiah portrays the young man Josiah. He says, the breath of our nostril. <laughs> In other words, our Messiah. <laughs> the breath of our nostrils, the anointed of the Lord, was caught in their pits, of whom we said, under his shadows, we shall live among in other words, the entire nation of Israel hoped that this was a new David who was going to give them victory around the neighbors that oppressed them. So they felt that this new king who loves God, just like God used David against Goliath, he would use him and under his leadership, Israel will live at peace and in plenty. And lo and behold, the young man dies. Not yet 40. Now the question that arises or the questions that come after this experience, people in Israel began to ask the following question. Number one, they asked a fundamental question. What had the whole reform of the king achieved? If God cannot defend his king, why did we really throw away our gods, remove our rings? Was it necessary? Because in the old times when we did it, David, God protected David. So why? What, 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 what was it? Then they asked another one. Was the exclusive worship to God, Yahweh, a mistake? Was it a mistake to only devote to Yahweh and leave these others we had? Couldn't we combine Maybe that was the mistake. We, we trusted so much in one. And yet we could have combined a bit. Not so. Yes. And, and today, isn't it true today? You go to the shrine a bit and also combine. When God does not answer now, you, you, you squeeze in and go and consult and say, tell me now what is going on. <laughs> and then when you, you come back on Sabbath and say, oh, to God we love you. You can keep quiet for now because I have a solution. I got one yesterday. But for now, you, you can keep quiet. And when it is serious, we'll come back. They say to themselves, why did we give up our gods? Then another question they asked to us. Was it, is it possible that when we went to this God of ours, the others were annoyed? That's why they have come and they have destroyed us now. Because this time, every nation fought against its God. Babylon, Madok, Egypt, Osiris, and others. And then Israel fought against others in the name of Yahweh. So the question was, mm, was it that when we came back to Yahweh, we offended the other ones. That's why they have defeated us. They came with so much power. Mm -hmm. And when they thought through these questions, some of them made resolutions, like some of us do eh, when things don't work out. And this was one of them. 
Ezekiel chapter 8, God calls Ezekiel and asks him and saves him, come and see what people are doing now. Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 12 is what we will read for this evening. The Bible says, then the Lord called to Ezekiel and said, then he said to me, son of man, have you seen what the elders of the house of Israel do in the dark? In other words, they have answered number two. They are saying now, we must have two. You must have plan B. This business of having, having one plan is not reliable. Plan? So in the dark, they went back to their small gods. After all, God is quiet. Eh? Mm-hmm. And then the Bible says, God continues and says to this young man, Ezekiel, he says to him, every man in the room of his idol. For they say, the Lord does not, the Lord has, hasn't he? Hasn't he really forsaken the land? If God cannot defend Josiah, who will he defend? Talk to me. Who? If God does not defend you who is praising him, who will he ever defend now? Talk to me. So the people concluded and says God has forsaken us. To make matters worse, Jeremiah visits a group that is in Egypt after this experience and he begins to talk to them. He says to people, why are you doing what you are doing? They were worshipping the queen of heaven. Uh, And then they respond to him and say, but we will certainly do whatever has gone out of our own mouth. And they were talking to a prophet now. They were saying, prophet now, let us speak to you boldly. Those days we used to respect you, but not now. Because the God you are speaking for is not serious. Now let us tell you the fact. We will certainly do whatever has gone out of our own mouth. To burn incense to the queen of heaven. And pour out drink offering to her as we have done. And then they add, they say, hmm. Uh, We and our fathers, our kings and our princes in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, we used to do these things before this Josiah money came. So now we have gone back to where we came from. So the Bible says, for then we had plenty of food. Mm, We were well off and we saw no. Isn't it true that sometimes when you are not worshipping God, things are okay? And the day you say, now God, mm, I've come. As you leave Muzida, you get bad news. Eh? That the project you are starting of chicken, the guys have come and they have put down the bands. <laughs> on TV recently, there was a lady who had about 7,000 birds on a piece of land. And then someone bought the land, there were quarrels, and he got a court order, he came, he brought thugs, they kicked everything, they killed the birds, others flew, people were just picking, oh, manna, quills from heaven, they were coming, and they were picking, and, and the woman was screaming, and saying, all oh, my investment is here, what will I ever do? Now, that is, that's the, you come to God, and you say, God, protect my property. And as you are finishing the service, they call you, you know what, every bird is on its own. Some are returning to their maker. <laughs> and, and so this guy says, we never used to have trouble. It, trouble has only begun now. Eh? Now, when we became serious trouble, Jeremiah, go back to Jerusalem, talk to yourself and your God, relax, enjoy yourself. It, it is up to you. You can have fun with your God, but for us, no. And they said, but since we stopped burning essence to the queen of heaven and pouring out drink offering to her. We have lacked everything and have been consumed by the and ever since we stopped in other words ever since the days of Josiah we have only seen trouble. And so the women concluded, and you know in Israel women would not speak, but when you found women who are speaking, that means it is serious. Mm-hmm. So the, women, the Bible says, 
I'm telling you the truth. Women, that's why Paul says, women keep quiet and go and consult your husbands at, at home. But these ones are speaking not only to men, but to a prophet. They even told the prophet, the Bible says, the women also said, and when we burnt incense to the queen of heaven and poured out our drink offerings to her, did we make cakes for her to worship her and pour out drinks offering without the permission of our husbands? Now, Jeremiah, what are you saying? <laughs> Jeremiah was disturbed. And so it's in this context, as these guys are still there, in 605, B.C. Nebuchadnezzar comes and surrounds Jerusalem in still this state. And then something strange happens. You know, you remember the man who died while trying to touch the ark of the Lord. Because a Lev if you are not a Levite, you cannot touch it. So the Jews were so scared of the holy, most holy place. Now, this heathen man, Nebuchadnezzar, with his general, the general comes, they surround Israel to the point of famine until Israel gives in. It breaks down. They come straight in, and then they say, where is the temple? They say, the temple is there. And everyone says, aha, uh -huh, at least on Josiah, God did not respond. But surely, these infidels, eh? these bastards, today, it's their day. Hallelujah. God in heaven, today, if you don't speak, we are finished. And then the Bible says, these infidel, uncircumcised heathens, came. They came and came to the courts of the temple. People were peeping. They said, aha, uh -huh, go further, you see. <laughs> then, then, you know, because Gentiles would only start in the outer court. So they came to the holy place. The guy, the general was just saying, where, 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 where have you put gold? Where? Where? Offering, offering and tithe, where? And, and then he, he went into the holy place. Uh -huh. They said, even Aaron, when he goes there and the high priest, he goes with the bell. We can't enter, we just pull him. Let them make a mistake and go. And then the Bible says these guys went there. <laughs> they looked for God, picked it, came out with the vessels. <laughs> and, and, and then they were alive. People looked at them like this. They said, oh, what is happening? Surely God is dead. <laughs> and this is the reality. God is what? So the Bible gives a very shocking description of what is happening in the book of Daniel chapter 1. The Bible says, oh, no friends in the third year. Of the reign of King Jehoiakim, one of the sons of uh, Josiah, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And verse 2 says, And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hands and some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the articles in the treasure house of God. Every Jew at this point was now dumbfounded. This was the last nail in the coffin of God. A Jew cannot bear this. At least the first one, Josiah, can die. But God, you enter his temple. You even go to the holy place. You pick things and walk out and you are still smiling. Two weeks later, you are alive. <laughs> this, this cannot be. So the Bible says that in these days, uh, he did not only do that. Uh, uh, the king said to this man, the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles to, 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 to Babylon. Ah, You see, you people, you have never been in a disappointment. In 1844, people were there. But ours is still coming, maybe. But let me tell you, you can never be disappointed to the extent that your best king dies. The articles of your God are taken. And to make matters, your best people in the land are also taken, your leaders. And then the Bible says, you know, God is amazing. That's why I told you never despise prophecy. Because God had talked about this long time ago in the days of the kings. He had said to Ezekiah, and they shall take away some of your sons who will descend from you, whom you will beget, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of. 
Let me tell you sometimes, God will keep quiet in your life because some prophecy must be fulfilled. So when you know prophecy, you will not be alarmed when God is silent. While they were asking why God is quiet, God knew that this would come to pass and surely it will come to pass. And so the Bible tells us that this guy is sat by the rivers of Babylon. <laughs> and they said, by the rivers of Babylon. There we sat down. Yeah, we wept. And we remembered Zion. We hung our harps. In other words, we said we will not sing again. Upon the willows of the main midst of it. And then the Bible says, for there, those who carried us away captive mocked us in a sense of asking for a song. And those who plundered us requested for a song of mat saying, sing us one of those songs you used to sing to Zion. In other words, they were saying, you used to tell us that your God is powerful. Uh -huh. sing, please sing that song you used to sing to God be what? Hallelujah. Sing it, sing it, we hear. And then, and, then, and then the Jews sat by the rivers of Babylon. They looked to heaven and said to God, God, where are you? How can we be mocked like this, God? And it is in the midst of this kind of disappointment and confusion that the God in heaven looks down at his people in the greatest of disappointment. He gives the greatest of revelation. So the Bible tells us that Daniel begins to unfold the greatest experience of the Bible. The book of Daniel, by structure, is the, the first half of the book has a lot of history, historical events. And so the but one to six is mainly a straightforward narrative. We are just narrating stories, apart from Daniel chapter two. But the rest is just a narrative that describes what happened. But the most interesting that will occupy us this entire week is the book, the other half of the book, which is starting from chapter 7, verse 12, where chapter 7 is the hinge or is the middle of the book and is the, most, is, is the base upon which the entire book swings, either in the beginning or at the end. And so when you understand chapter 7, it will give you a great synopsis of the entire part that rests. And also it will help us to map ourselves to Daniel chapter 2. And so the entire week we're going to spend, we'll only deal with one chapter here and we'll spend a lot of our times in this chapter. And this is where it is hard to understand. Here it is very easy, you can see it. A golden statue, you can see people not bowing and you can say hallelujah. When they throw you into a furnace, you just stand with God and God will be with you. And so the theme of the book can be clustered in these four things. Number one, the theme of the book of Daniel is to the effect that God of Israel is the only true God, that he is far above all the heathen idols, kings and empires. Because remember, the question in the Jewish mind is, is our God weaker than the heathen kings? To the extent that all things have happened the way they have happened, could it be true that our God is weaker? And in the book of Daniel, God responds by saying, I am what I am. I'm supreme. I'm stronger than those kings. I'm stronger than the empires. I'm stronger than those gods to whom you are running now. You get a stand strong with me because I am who I am. Number two, he is in control and is the ultimate victory is certain. Those who stand with God have the assurance that their victory is sure forever. That's what Daniel is going to bring to our attention. It reveals to us that if we remain with God, we are sure and our victory is certain forever. And number three, which is the final essence of the book, the saints of God or those who hold on to the faith of God in the midst of the disappointment will be glorified and vindicated, but they must remain faithful until the end, whatever the cost. And I will show you these themes as we get to the entire Bible. But the purpose of the book in a nutshell is godless man may appear to be all-powerful but God is in control. In his own time, he will destroy his enemies and his saints will be vindicated and 
exalted. In other words, people might appear to be powerful, institutions might appear to be powerful, but it's because their time has not yet come. In the fullness of God's time in prophecy, they will come crumbling down as God has indicated through prophecy. And I'll show you how accurate God has been in his prediction. And if any man pays attention, that's why Jesus says to the disciples, if you can only know what Daniel talked about, you will not be surprised. And so, in conclusion almost, allow me to show you how God is presenting this difference between even gods and himself. When you read Isaiah chapter 41, God is having an argument with the idols and the heathen and all those other gods. And this is what he says to them. Present your case, says the Lord. Bring forth your strong reasons. In other words, if those gods have some reasons, uh, it is time now to compare notes. God says, I stand here. Let them stand there. Let them bring their strong reasons. And I will also demonstrate to you that I'm not there much. So the book of Daniel brings a war, a conflict between God and the heathen gods and the gods of this world. And he wants to demonstrate that he surpasses them all. And he says to them, says the king of Jacob. And the Bible says, God says and gives a challenge. You know these days, eh? there is something I have seen. I had not seen it. I don't know what it is. Eh? Like people falling dead. What is that? You know, I saw one of my former friends, uh, Kasumba Samson, eh? after reading news, he fell down. Then they said, Kasumba has taken the challenge. So I was wondering what this challenge is. Eh? <laughs> and, and then I saw, I saw some other people in a conference room as if someone was dictating and giving a business lecture and then everyone was dying like this, and then dying like this, and then dying in front, and then I don't know how many times they died, but they seem to be dying. And then I noticed that probably this is the challenge. I think there is a song that people are challenging and it has to that effect. And so even God says, okay, let us go into a challenge. And then he says, come. Prove to me that you are real and I will show you. Then the Bible says, let these gods bring forth and show us what will happen. In other words, God is saying, the only litmus test in chemistry that would distinguish who is supreme, let him tell us, let them tell us what will happen. If it happens the way they tell it, then sure that they are supreme. In other words, in the book of Daniel, what God is simply doing is going to tell exactly what will happen before it happens. And so you can know that he's God and is supreme above all other gods. And so God says, let them show the former things what they were that we may consider them and know the latter end of them or declare it to us the things which are to come. In other words, the supreme God must be able to declare what will come and it comes to pass exactly. That's why the Bible says, God is not a man that he should lie. Nor that is this son of man that he should turn around. Hasn't he said and will he not perform it? He will. That's why Peter says, we have the sure word of prophecy confirmed. Which you do well to take heed. Why? Because God has given it as a challenge. And I want to say to you clearly, my good friends, the prophecy is going to come exactly as God has given because he has challenged you. He has told it to you and you know it and it will happen exactly the way it is. In fact, when you read another passage in Isaiah, in 23, it says, Show the things that are to come hereafter that we may know that you are God's. Sure. In other words, if they are gods, let them tell us predictively what will happen and let it happen to accuracy. Because only God can do that. And so the Bible says, yes, do good or do evil that we may be dismayed and see it together. And then Isaiah 44 Verse 6, the Bible says, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me there is no, no God. And then he adds, And who can proclaim as I do 
It's a challenge. It's a question. Do you know anyone who can proclaim as God does? Do you know anyone who can give prophecy the way God does done and gives it in the same way he does it? And then the Bible says, Learn, let him declare it and set it in order for me. Since I appointed the ancient people, I have predicted things and they have been. And then the Bible says, And the things that are coming and shall come. In other words, I have proclaimed the things that are coming and shall come. That's why Jesus said, before the end of the world, the things that will be Daniel has spoken about. That's why he tells his disciples, pay attention to Daniel. I don't know about you, but for me, I feel I need to know what is coming so that I am better prepared. And so the Bible says uh, in Isaiah 46, verse 9 and 10, again, God challenges the gods. He says to them, remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. And why there is no one like God? The reason is simple. Declaring the end from? In other words, God can tell you the end. From the very beginning. And as I will show you this week in the book of Daniel, he has told us the end from the beginning. And everything is going down to detail. When he says many will be lost, surely many will be lost. Because they did not have the love for the truth. And so he says, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient time, things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. And Isaiah crowns it in Isaiah 48. He says, I have declared the former things from the beginning. They went forth from my mouth and I caused them to hear it. Suddenly I did them, and they, come, they came to pass. In other words, God speaks through Daniel to the children of Israel, and he tells them, though it appears as if I'm defeated, but I'm in control. I know what I'm doing. And he speaks to the Christian in the same way. The world might appear to you as if it is overwhelming you. As if we are losing it. But no sir, we were built on the rock and the rock that will stand. And when finally the time comes, we will be vindicated and glorified in Jesus Christ. And again he says, even from the beginning, I have declared it to you. Before it came to pass, I proclaimed it to you, lest you should say, my idol has done them. And my carved image and my molded image have commanded them. So God gives prophecy so that you may never have an excuse that it happened by chance. You never trust any other God. You not go to the witch doctor and say she was responsible, he was responsible. God will tell you what will happen so that you can have undisputed confidence in God because his word is sure and his, our God is able and he surely will perform what he says because he's not a man. And I would like to say to you, my good friends, Amos saw it from afar and says, surely the Lord does not do anything unless he reveals it to his servants, the prophets. God has a habit of revealing his secrets to his people so that when they walk in the midst of the silence of God, they may not lose faith, that they may know that even in the darkest of moments, God is still in control. And then God says to Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 22. He says when a prophet speaks in my name, in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. In other words, my dear friends, the prophet when he speaks, his word must come or her word must come to pass. And that is why if we enter the book of Daniel, we want to find out if what God spoke came to pass. And I would like to interest you in knowing that God has been accurate. 
And in a book of Daniel, we can find that level of accuracy that will give us the added confidence to trust in God's words and believe that God cares. In fact, when I look at John chapter 14, as Jesus is about to go forth onto the cross and finish his rest, the Bible tells us, and he said to the disciples, and now I have told you before it comes, that when it does come to pass, you may believe. The essence is that when God gives prophecy, that we may use that prophecy to anchor our faith in God and have more confidence in God. And so Jesus says, I will no longer talk much with you for the ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me. In other words, even Jesus said certain things, but the intention was that when they come to pass, the disciples might look back and say, surely God's word stands forever and it will always come to pass. And so I want to say there are three observations in the book of Daniel that I will leave with you. The Bible says in the book of Daniel, because God has predicted the future, we can be sure that he is superior to the heathen gods and that he is in control. And that is number one that we'll find in the book of Daniel according to the experience. Number two, that although the forces of evil would appear to triumph, this would not be the end. God would intervene and establish his kingdom forever. And that is an undisputed fact and I'll show you tomorrow. But there's another observation, number three, which is when you look at the section of the Bible from chapter two verse four to chapter seven verse 28, the book of Daniel is written in a language called Aramaic. But when you get to chapter 7 onwards, uh, 29 onwards, and 8, 9, 10, 11, the book is written in Hebrew, and in chapter 1 it's written in Hebrew. And the reason this is because Aramaic was the linga franca of the time. It was like English. Everyone in the kingdom spoke Aramaic. And because the material between chapter 2 and the historical happened for the entire empire and the prophecy of Daniel which chapter 7 verse, uh, verse uh, chapter 7 the entire verse up to 25 and chapter 2 speak to the entire universe from the time of Babylon to the end of the world it must be communicated in a language that all can understand to communicate a fundamental fact that this prophecy is not for Israel but for the entire world. That's why Daniel, after chapter 7, because he was talking about sanctuary and all the other things, he switched to the Hebrew language and he spoke directly to his people. But when he was speaking about these things that are in chapter 2, 4 to chapter 7, 8, he spoke and wrote in Aramaic so that everyone might read and understand what is there. Because God's intention was that this prophecy may go out to everyone, every language, every tongue, every kindred, and every nation, that every tongue might know that Jesus is Lord and that God is the supreme king of kings and the lord of lords and he will reign supreme in all situations and so next uh, tomorrow i will introduce you to the empire of babylon and i want to speak to you and say the book of daniel requires us to have understanding according to daniel 12 chapter verse 3 he says let him who has understanding apply that understanding you cannot understand the book of daniel unless you have understanding and that means we need the holy spirit the book of daniel also presents the truth that as something that must be understood significantly and in the book of daniel the very common word there is understand in aramaic and so we will do well if we carry the love of God with us and it urges us to be faithful to the end. And that's why my good friends, I want to invite you to pay attention and give the Bible a thought.